That was the president a little bit earlier on with that all-important announcement. Well, joining us via Zoom is Professor Adrian Puren, who's uh, acting director at the National Institute for Com Communicable Diseases of South Africa. Prof, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, how timely okay. is, is this announcement made uh, by the WHO in terms of uh, developing of the mRNA Yes, no, it, it is very timely. And as you know, I mean, we really want um, vaccines out as soon as possible. Um, obviously, this particular development will, will take time to implement, but it's really a critical step um, in, the, in the case of South Africa and the, the African continent as, as a whole. It's been a long-held uh, dream, I think, for, for WHO for vaccine development, not only um, in Africa, but in Asia as well. So I think this is a very important step, not only for South Africa, but for so WHO in terms of realizing um, a particular aspiration to have vaccine development um, be in place in, in, in Africa. So this is really key. All right. I mean, we've seen with uh, COVID-19 and trying to get uh, vaccines, uh, the, the obvious re reason for something like this um, but I wonder, when we start doing the research, does that mean we're going to concentrate on variants and diseases peculiar to the continent? Yes, yeah, so the expression of interest uh, by the WHO really focused on, on the mRNA vaccine specifically, essentially because um, it, they've been proven to take a short um, duration in terms of its development, uh, and as well as the fact that these are highly adaptable and have been proven to be highly efficient in terms of va vaccines. Therefore, um, if you're thinking not just only in terms of the production of mRNA vaccines, but also the ability to adapt and address, for example, your question around the variants. So we have specific variants in circulation. mRNA vaccine uh, adaptation to these is, is feasible and possible and and can be done fairly rapidly. But in addition to that, um, not only is the focus now on COVID-19, but in fact, mRNA vaccines, not only in the communicable diseases um, area, but also beyond that, for example, cancer. So it's really, those are some of the great advantages mm -hmm. of mRNA, and therefore the expression was really focused on developing a hub specifically um, around the mRNA vaccines. All right, I've just realized that we're busy talking about this uh, term, mRNA. Uh, the whole time. Yes. Let's explain that for our viewers. Yes, so um, when you look at a, a virus, it's made up of various proteins and lipids and so forth. So it's when we talk about the um, particular proteins that the antibodies res uh, that are made or manufactured that are seen as foreign, and these are, if you like, trans translated by what we call a messenger RNA. It has the code for this particular protein. So the mRNA that is injected as part of the vaccine um, results in the expression of that particular protein structure. And what codes for it is, is the so-called messenger RNA. And that's why they're mm. called mRNA vaccines, yes. All right, so uh, in simple terms, because I try and think about it in my head, you inject something that looks and behaves like the real thing and teach the body how to react to this thing, to recognize it when it finally comes into your body, the real thing, and then it knows what to do. Yes, so you inject what is called the, the messenger RNA. It's, it's yeah. uh, coated by lipid particles. It enters, for example, um, the immune cells. It has the code. So if you remember, like your bank yeah. code, for example, as a, or your ID code, yeah. and it's the, just the reverse of that. And when it enters the body, it's read, that code is read and translated into the amino acids which make up a protein. Right. And that protein is released into circulation and is recognized as foreign. And the response of the body, therefore, is to produce what we call the antibodies. And that, that's the, the basis of, of the, okay. the vaccine and, and immunization, yes. All right, so tell us the process of uh, technology transfer. What, what will happen? How does that work? Yeah, so they had specific criteria, and I suppose that's where BIVAC and Afrigen um, fitted the, the criteria in the sense that you will not only be able to manufacture vaccines, but to manufacture at, at scale and have the technologies abil available, as well as um, experience in clinical field work, for example. So BioVac and Afrigen, as well as the academic partners, um, certainly fitted that particular bill in order for them to, be, to come together, 
for the exchange of the mRNA technology. And again, um, the, the availability of this technology is not prefaced on IP necessarily, but at least will be available mm. or be negotiated in order for that IP to become available for that particular hub um, to be able to manufacture uh, vaccines at, at, at scale. And also then obviously as a low middle in, income company that serves as the, the hub to then expand beyond in terms of the spokes of that particular hub to expand the technology beyond that particular hub. Mm -hmm. So that those are the, the key aspects of, of this particular technology um, um, hub. All right. I mean, I, I, I'm understanding quite clearly uh, the idea of localizing these uh, um, hubs and uh, making it quicker to access and to distribute. Um, I just wonder if, you know, when we talk about vaccines, what we've seen with COVID-19 and other diseases sometimes is that population groupings, ages and those kinds of things become interesting variants in terms of how one reacts to these, these, uh, vac uh, to these uh, uh, viruses. So I suppose it will help a great deal to have the research locally because we have mainly uh, African populations on the continent, quite unlike the US where they would have been doing their tests and Europe. No, that's true in part, but I think if you look at clinical trials, you're quite right. That's an important mm. consideration, and that's why the clinical trials that have been conducted have been conducted in many countries, for example, in order for them to have a look at a range of geographic um, locations with regard to you know, disease profiles, um, demographic profiles, mm. in order to get as much knowledge that they can about the efficacy of, of a particular um, vaccine and as well as factors that may well affect um, the vaccine in terms of, of its particular efficacy. But beyond that, of course, mm. is you, you're quite right. We have specific um, considerations in South Africa. Let's say take TB and HIV, for example, uh, not other non-communicable diseases. How does this interplay um, affect vaccine efficacy? And mm. so I think that these are great opportunities, not just for South Africa, but, but for the continent as well, in terms of understanding within a particular uh, context how vaccines will actually work and function. And of course, adapt vaccines to specific uh, requirements or needs. So that, that's also yeah. a very critical consideration. And, and I suppose um, when I think about Ebola, uh, had that been global, we would have probably seen a vaccine much quicker uh, than it eventually came. Because it was localized and on the continent, that would have been an opportunity for us to act urgently to find a vaccine. Yeah, so that, that reprise provides those sort of opportunities. In mm. fact, as I said, you know, it's a localized, um, you can then focus on your specific needs. Yeah. And I, I suppose that's why the interest, uh, like, for example, Ebola, you know, because these events are, are rare events, but they're devastating events. Um, but yet the interest and the ability to invest in that becomes very difficult or is seen as being difficult. And therefore, you're quite right. These types of investments, I hope, will allow, therefore, one to respond to specific requirements or, or needs. Yes. All right. Let's talk about COVID-19 and the state of play now. Um, you know, the numbers are shocking and quite scary. W what do you understand about where we are, you think, on the curve at this time? <clears throat> Yes, so we definitely, in terms of the upward trajectory, um, Hadeng, Hadeng certainly um, has the majority of the cases. I think about 66 or 67 percent of the cases that we are still currently reporting um, are from Hadeng. However, there is an increase in the, the Western Cape as well and some of the other provinces. Um, I think the Northern Cape, I think, is a province that where we probably have reached its peak and is starting to decline. But a consequence, obviously, with these large numbers, especially in, in Kharteng, are the increased um, hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. And obviously, a subsequent consequence, I'm afraid, of that is, is really um, an increase in, in, in mortality. But certainly Kharteng um, certainly takes the lead compared to um, KwaZulu-Natal yeah. and um, the Eastern Cape. So in the whole, um, my sense is that we should, if the models are correct, and as you know, these are models, they, they certainly paint particular pictures, but certainly Gauteng has behaved where the, the model has uh, predicted it may, may well do. Um, whereas I think we're still hoping that, um, in terms of the model predictions, that we should not see as great a wave um, in the other provinces. But let, let's see what's, what, what will transpire over the next um, few weeks. All right, so the last time, phase one, we slowed it down by a full lockdown. 
What will slow it down this time around? So, yes, yeah, so we've certainly, I, I think, went from a lockdown one again to a level three, readjusted level three. So I'm hoping that that will have some effect. But I think if the trajectory is onward um, and upward in terms of Gauteng, there may well be some additional readjustments. I'm hoping that with the level three ad ad adjusted um, for the rest of the country, at least, I think that has come, as I hope, sufficiently early um, for one to, again, to try and, and stave off um, such high levels that, that we saw in the, in the second wave. So I think it's, again, coming back to the fact that our union provinces do have their preparedness plans um, in order to um, adjust to and manage uh, and, and mitigate risk. So I, I'm hoping that this, again, provides those opportunities um, by slowing down transmissions that in terms of hospital readiness, that means bed capacity, oxygen, that those logistics are in place and, and are, are ready um, and hoping that we don't reach the same levels as we have um, in the second wave. But Hateng obviously is, is, is of, of, of great concern. So best bet uh, until you get a vaccine is to do the protocols and do them really well this time. Absolutely. I, I know we've been through more than a year of, of this, but I'm afraid we have to reiterate, revitalize the non-pharmaceutical interventions. Um, that becomes really critical. Um, you know, I'm sure you have heard all the anecdotes of people closer and closer to you being infected, and that's what, mm -hmm. you know, we're all experiencing. So it comes back to the fact that the so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, the wearing of masks, the physical distancing, if you don't have to work, go into work and can stay at home and can afford to work from home, then that, that's great. If you have to travel, I know that those risks are, are greater for you, especially if you're in the taxis uh, where ventilation is, is limited. You're going to be in close contact. Um, but at work, at least, again, I, you know, I really urge business people to take this very seriously and make sure that the, the workspaces are safe. Um, that ventilation um, is in place, similar to businesses that run restaurants and malls, again, to try and ensure that, you know, you really keep your, your clients as, as safe as, as, as possible. Professor Adrian Perrin, always good talking to you. Thanks so much indeed for joining you, us and your sure. insights. Thank you. Right, that's uh, Professor Edrin Purent, Acting Director at the uh, National Institute for Communicable Diseases of South Africa. And honestly, this is your best bet right now. Um, it's never too far away from me. So make sure you're constantly covering up. It could save a life. It could be yours. <laughs>